Welcome to the Future Is Now Digest. I'm Miguel Francis Santiago. This is your regular coverage in light of COVID-19, its origins, its effects, and its potential opportunities that we kindly discuss here by combining facts with some theory and, of course, looking for the truth, because the truth is somewhere in the middle. Uh, we're going to be focusing today on some of the latest events. I mean, some of, some of them include, of course, the fact that well, we have surpassed a million cases uh, in the world. There's over 60,000 deaths as of now. Uh, and as we keep uh, going through this information, I keep, go I keep coming up with this simple uh, sort of, what's the right word? I, I keep coming up with this simple way to really understand how terrible is this situation. Is it really that terrible? And this is something that's been uh, given to me by Didi Taihuru, the Bitcoin dad the, from the Bitcoin family. Uh, if you recall, the man who sold all of his uh, uh, property and goods in uh, trade for Bitcoin and has been living off Bitcoin successfully for the last several years. Uh, and he told me to go to the world population calculator, the daily world population clock. It's called world meter, uh, worldometers.info. And again, the births that we had today is 194,000 births. We had 81,000 deaths today, just today. We had about 60,000 yesterday, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, deaths this year so far, again, 15.3 million deaths this year. Okay, while the births so far in 2020, as of April, the fourth month of the year, uh, we have 36 million births. The population growth just this year alone is 21 million people, all right? Now, again, if we take into consideration the current stats of the COVID-19 pandemic with over a million infected and, oh, God, over 60,000 dead, that is truly sad. But it is nothing compared to just today's birth and death stats from the current world population calendar. So this is something to uh, really understand and it's very important to understand uh, that the current media panic that is being created around this virus is still aimed more at the economical aspect of this whole situation and our theory here at the future is now media group is that the powers that be are taking advantage of your mind and the economy by using the situation to propel certain needs Certain needs such as technocracy, such as total government control, such as more government influence in our everyday affairs, as we already see it being tested all over the world, with essentially countries in Europe copying the QR code uh, technology that China has to allow people to move around the city. These are unprecedented Orwellian draconian uh, ways to control society. I mean. What's happening in India? You know, people can't go outside. They are going outside. They shouldn't. They're in quarantine. But what does the Indian police do? They beat them with sticks. Okay? In Kenya, we had a 13-year-old boy get shot by the police because he was outside. You know, in Moscow, Russia, uh, a man was taken uh, to the local precinct for breaking quarantine, for walking his dog in the park. You know, because, you know, dogs got to do their business. And what the most horrible thing about that case is that the dog was left alone in the park while the owner was packaged into a police car and taken away. So the panic, the, the polemical pandemic, as I like to call it, that's been uh, definitely installed as a part of this uh, COVID-19 crisis. And really the disruptive industry, our industries, you know, of blockchain, AI, CBD, iGaming, uh, you know, you name it, We've been limited in our potential of growth because we've been growing beautifully over the last two years and uh, in some ways even stepping on the toes of these powers that be. Uh, so now the question is, what do we do? You know, we want mass adoption, but do we side with the government? Do we help them with our knowledge that we've been able to accumulate to perhaps uh, introduce some of these technologies through this uh, polemical pandemic? Uh, or do we keep this to ourselves? That's the big question. I mean, honestly, if and obviously, if we want to grow and create capital, the smartest thing to do would be to work with the governments right now uh, in times of this looming pandemic. 
if we, uh, a lot of crypto anarchists out there, you know, like Pavel Durov of Telegram, for example, still does not give in to any of the SEC uh, uh, petitions and uh, questions that the SEC has for the TAN network and the Gram token. So this is just some of the polemics that are brewing in the space, and we're going to discuss it all today with our good friend, special guest of ours, uh, joining us live from Pakistan, Mohammed Salman Anjoun, the managing director of Avantis Tech. Mohammed, welcome to the show. How are you? I'm good. Thanks for having me, McGill. It's been lovely again to see you and uh, discuss with you things about uh, new trends and what's happening around. And uh, my salam and uh, a lot of like regards to everyone everywhere in the world. That's great. Now, I know you're joining us live from Pakistan. You have a residence there, even though you are Dubai born and you lived your whole life between the two places. Uh, how is it right now in Pakistan? What's the situation uh, there? Uh, and have you witnessed anything personally as far as, you know, people feeling ill or maybe, you know, of someone who actually passed, unfortunately, from this virus? Yeah, first of all, the situation is, of course, uh, like other countries, it's not very good. And uh, it's been prevailing uh, in the last, uh, growing in the last few days. Uh, today, now the count is somewhere between three and a half thousand, I guess, uh, for the impacted cases. The casualties are still 45, which if you compare with uh, the oversight, over, like all size of the population, which is 220 million, is not that big. But the potential for this to grow quickly is there. And uh, as you asked, if I have seen something with my own eyes, uh, you can see my beard, it's almost like three weeks grown. So I had no chance to go out. Actually, I could go, but I wanted to like stay uh, safe, uh, keep things safe for my family and for myself. And uh, because if you go out, obviously there's a chance to like get things uh, back from outside. Right. And I'm sure you have some friends in Pakistan or a network of people that you know. Uh, has anyone there reported any potential uh, cases or, unfortunately, again, any deaths out of your overall network of friends and people you know? All right. In our like uh, city, it's a very big city, I think around six million people. So uh, we have around 90 odd cases. And uh, one, I for sure know that there is a family of uh, which I know that uh, they have three family members who have been impacted, but uh, the symptoms are not very strong. So they've been kept in isolation at home. So they didn't took, uh, take them for uh, like quarantine in some isolation center or in some hospital. So they did test it positive, but at the same time, the symptoms are not that strong. So they're in the house-based, home-based isolation. I see. And how is Dubai doing uh, this whole quarantine? What news? I'm sure, again, you have friends there since you do live there uh, most of the time uh, and you got locked out in Pakistan. Uh, what's the situation in Dubai to your awareness? Dubai, uh, the cases are not that high, but still, if you ask me about the measures the government has taken, uh, they are like of a very, very extreme nature. And uh, I cannot comment whether it's good uh, or not, but obviously they have taken it uh, in a good intention. So a lot of like uh, curfew kind of a situation, 24 seven since yesterday, before that it was like uh, only for the, from 8 p.m. to 6 a.m. And now it's 24 seven. They don't call it curfew, but they call it some kind of uh, disinfection movement, which it's okay because they're doing it. Yes, uh, it's not just the word they're using it, our terminology. They're doing a lot of disinfection of streets, of uh, any any side of the country. They're like trying to like uh, do the disinfection. Well, and again, these are some to some extent draconian measures, but again, because of this, of this pandemic, or at least what it is made to be, uh, we are finding an excuse to, to, to test these draconian measures. And that's one of the things that we have sort of uh, been catching on here as, as, a, as a trend of sorts for uh, um, this whole event. Uh, and what I mentioned earlier about the stats of the deaths that we even had today in the world, uh, 
which is already at you know uh, sixty thousand just today, just overall depths. You know, uh, yesterday it was like one twenty or eighty thousand. I can't remember. So you know, uh, if you take into account the uh, actual life versus death ratio that's happening daily on the planet, this whole COVID nineteen doesn't seem to be that big of a deal. Uh, some scientists even say that it doesn't fit the parameters of a pandemic because apparently a pandemic is only instilled when an actual 5% of the total world population becomes sick with the virus and uh, you know then it becomes a pandemic so that would be what at least 500 million people <laughs> so there is a lot of again polemical views on this subject what do you think about these uh, uh, daily birth to, to death stats that I mentioned? Uh, do they really uh, show us that perhaps this whole COVID-19 and, you know, 1 million infected, 60,000 dead is a little overblown? All right. So I have a view. Uh, actually, it's I have traveled like around 15 countries since the outbreak of uh, covid and it's been uh, known to the world since Jan early January. So I've been to like all the continents, literally. The, it, the world has never seen this kind of a phenomena before. Uh, let me give them a margin. The governments, uh, I want to give them a margin for uh, uh, not being tested for this kind of a potential pandemic. I agree with you that it is not classifying as a pandemic, but it has a potential. We have to agree on this point that it has a potential. The country has uh, been torn off uh, with very badly by this, uh, and where it is becoming a pandemic, like at least Spain, some part of the uh, other parts of uh, Europe, and now you can see America as well. So it is potentially a pandemic, if not a pandemic now. So I think they overreacted in some regards. And why I say so, because they could have avoided some of the cases, uh, the number of cases they could have avoided when uh, they saw this thing happening in China, since they could have modeled the China's uh, way of uh, like curbing it, or at least they could have prepared themselves better than the curfew situation. That's a repetitive uh, theme, by the way, Mo, that we've been getting here from our guests like yourself, that, you know, every country closed its doors a little too late and almost as though it was purposely a little too late at least that's what it seemed like because every country had all the warnings to close you know yesterday but they did it two days later for some reason and nobody understands I, really why <laughs> i i'm totally i cannot say anything else then i'm shocked when i was like uh, landing to Heathrow, i was uh, like I didn't see any kind of a mayor to like screen people or who were coming, who were going out. Uh, same was the case in many other airports as well. And I'm surprised to say one more thing here. I'm Pakistani and I'm like frequently traveling every month. I've been traveling uh, back and forth. So here the airport started screening the passengers since I think the first week of, or maybe the last week of uh, December. I am shocked what I have seen in Europe. They are supposed to lead the world, West, I mean, uh, not just Europe, US and all the other leading uh, Western countries. They are leading in such preps, basically. And this time they had a very good visibility in China. There are so many conspiracy theories. Let's put them aside, but you could still have monitored the situation and act preemptively what is good potentially could happen. People were flying from China to uh, from Wuhan. How things got wrong in Italy in, at the first place? Because when Wuhan was getting closed down, people were getting laid off from their work, the leather industry people. Italy always wanted such skills because they also have a very good fashion industry uh, in their north. And everyone they pulled off from the Wuhan region and now people have seen what happened. And then they hold, held some conferences, events, without any precautionary measure. And what happened, it spread out into the neighboring countries. Now the whole Western part of the 
Europe is now in trouble. Same happened with the United States. They were also uh, doing the back and forth kind of like uh, uh, traveling and all that. So things could have been avoided uh, with the better monitoring of the situation. I would again say in Southeast Asia, not just China. If they were not open to the world, South Korea was there. Japan was uh, facing some situation. Some other countries, small countries, with Vietnam and other countries were having similar kind of a problem. So West could have seen what's happening there. The and that's economy. really the, that's really the question, you know. The, the question here is whether this was a manufactured event that is being blown out of proportion right now by the media, because let's face it, governments own the media. Uh, whether you like it or not, uh, this, to me at least, as a person who lived through the 9-11 crisis in New York in 2001, it really has a lot of the same footprints you know, when you, you let the planes fly in, you don't take them down, you let them fly into the buildings, right? Here, we have a similar situation. You let, you know, you know you, even now, right, the air travel over the United States is still open, you know? It just doesn't make sense. This whole thing has sort of been, like, invited, and now, even though most of the people have mild symptoms or are completely asymptomatic, even in Italy, you know, the majority of cases are elderly. And out of those cases, still only 5%, 5 to 10, depending on how you look at it, are lethal. And 99% of the deaths in Italy, just to let you know, this is a fact, have been elderly with one or two pre-concluding conditions. So either diabetes and heart disease or heart disease or AIDS and other things that already had their immune system completely in, you know, shattered when the virus hit them. So all, when you bring all this together, along with the numbers of the population uh, that uh, certainly show us that today we had more deaths than the whole COVID-19 outbreak, then the question is, are these really the proper measures? And this is where we, you know, get into the realm of not really conspiracy, but just facts that we have. You know, the virus was synthesized in 2015, the SARS and coronavirus, in November 2015. The scientific report by a group of scientists from the Louisiana uh, University. Uh, U.S. didn't like that. They asked them to leave. So they left to Wuhan. Okay. And with the P. Bright Institute, which is sponsored by Bill Gates they finished the virus, <laughs> you know, th and again, these are just facts. You don't, there's no conspiracy here. This is all public information. You could look at it. Uh, then of course, Bill and Melinda hold a uh, training exercise called Event 201 in October, 2019. So five months ago called the uh, impending loom of a pandemic. What would the people do if a novel coronavirus, I quote, hit the world and major uh, CEOs of, you know, UPS, uh, news companies, etc. They join in to basically hold this training exercise that is actually happening now in reality, you know. So all of these things, you know, you, you don't have to be a conspiracy theorist, I think. You just have to know how to take two, add two, and have four. You know, it all seems very weird. But regardless, again, whether that could be the truth or not, uh, we here feel that the disruptive tech industry has been really put to a corner. And now we have to find a way to work with the government, with the powers that be, uh, to actually get out of the hole, right? And to continue creating and uh, expanding this technology. Now, you've been in blockchain for quite some time. Uh, how are you adapting right now to this new uh, world order, really. Uh, whatever you have shared, I partially agree. And obviously, there are some things which I think so I'll still give doubts to the world leaders about that. But we cannot wait for two, three more years to bring privacy, uh, like protecting our privacy through blockchain. Now is the time. And that's what I'm like been uh, 
very extensively doing with my team there is always i believe there is an opportunity in the crisis and that's what i had a vision that in uh, two weeks back i felt that uh, we could do you've been mentioning about the privacy invasion by the government it is happening it will happen more now the privacy of everyone now been there are surveillance apps been used in several countries we all know that and uh, there will be more in coming days and weeks if there is a layer of blockchain that can help the surveillance bodies as well and at the same time that can help keep the security of the privacy of uh, there is a, there has to be a balance now between uh, the surveillance through security through surveillance and security through privacy as well because if you will keep on invading the privacy of the citizens eventually it can go in the wrong hands and like you will face a next pandemic based on that data on in rogue, rogue hands that's very true mo is is, is this yeah. something specifically that you're doing with with avantas tech or there's yeah. more to it yes uh, there are like again uh, f- the multiple features what uh, soft solution we are doing and that is uh, to counter the covid situation and there are three layers of crisis management at uh, this meds log which we have uh, which is under development with us at the moment addresses all three stages the first stage is the response stage to the pandemic or crisis so we are uh, bringing in the information highway a secured and authentic information highway for different ecosystem players to bring data together so to connect the dots of uh, covid situation at the moment there are like hospitals doing testing testing centers doing testing and that data is going through emails that data is going through telephone calls to some central authority and then they compile it few months down the road that data will have no value it gets and lost it yeah. it is garbage in garbage out kind of a thing and what will happen after four years or three years there is another pandemic and we would have learned nothing from this situation so data is the new oil everyone is saying and now is the time to prove that covid can be responded through data analytics for that you need a good data acquisition channel and uh, metlock is helping that first of all it's so metlock is and- aggregating the data uh number and one it, and it would then deliver it in a private and secure way to the point of destination which would could be the public could be essential authority could be everybody simultaneously because of the blockchain yes like for example if someone is traveling and uh, they don't have to carry their own certificate from testing lab that uh, they are they have been tested negative and now they are carrying no virus with them and on in on, at the immigration point someone can just access this uh, meds lock and then can get the status of that person's covid uh, situation uh, been in isolation it been into some kind of uh, impact or no impact so this that sounds happen. like something the government would be grabbing right now <laughs> have you had any success so far in negotiations or uh, progressing this we are we are in discussion with two or three government authorities uh, for for sure first of all it is going to be uh, helping the central uh, disaster management authorities uh, whether it's provincial state level or uh, national level and ultimately the, it can connect all of the ecosystem in the world and brings together the authentic and trusted data with the privacy uh, secured for the all citizens whatever they collect data are they do analytics they do it through blockchain so it stays in a trustable manner for the citizens for any other authority than just the government private entity that will can access it and it stays in the blockchain as a trusted source of uh, information so if we don't then they have their own ways to like control us further and further and further what's happening in singapore and south korea and china and now it's going to be happening in america soon and canada soon there are many like uh, tech uh, surveillance companies which are offering the, the same practical uh, softwares and apps to the government and you will see then in the name of uh, 
surveillance so people will be using so if we don't introduce now the block now the blockchain not for the crypto currency part but for our own privacy part i think this will be if we don't then we will lose it because they will start doing it and we will not be able to have uh, recovered from this situation after that and now is the time to prepare ourselves for us for our families for our society so that's my message medslock is doing sounds very uh, inspiring uh, and as long as you know the private keys could truly be decentralized from that blockchain system and then that system would in turn also serve good for the people because the people will have a validated secure and and uh, and, and open source way to check that data and actually uh, get a confirmation for what is really going on in the world so Mohammed, thank you so much uh, for your time this sounds like uh, one of the first things that I heard in this uh, COVID-19 crisis out of the disruptive tech space it could actually work so we wish you the best of luck uh, and uh, let's hope to see each other again on the future is now digest where we bring you the latest from the development of this polemical pandemic and beyond the future is what you make of it the future is now mohammed salman anjun thank you and i'm miguel francis santiago stay tuned to the future